Schneider. I'm the executive director of the Hop Growers of New York, a nonprofit uh, to support hop growing. And I've been asked to be moderator of this session, and I, I'm very humbled by that. And What? I was told to be, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of like, you know, make me the moderator or else, but I'm trying to work that out, like, uh, you know, stuff. But um, we have a wonderful panel here today, um, and uh, I'm here to help facilitate and to support you all in being able to communicate well with our panel and to help them communicate with you and make sure that we all learn as much as possible and you know I just want to let everyone know like this is a room like as a moderator I you know I, I do want to be able to be like hey like we're not focused on that right now if something comes up that's off you know off subject um, it does not mean I, I hope as the moderator that one thing that we can get out of this conference is something that is active and creates the want for you to go up and talk to these people at their booths after and learn more and learn more deeply what we uncover here today. Um, I think that's a, just having a conversation around New York ingredients is really amazing. We're very fortunate in this state um, to have that connection to agriculture. Um, and these people put a ton of time and energy into it. You all put a ton of time and energy into your craft. And I, I just want to make sure that we have a very healthy, open forum that we can all feel like safe to ask taboo questions, to learn more about each other and our roles in this, uh, this whole picture of everything. Um, I'm going to do my best job as the moderator to make sure we focus on the state of New York ingredients. We stay away from individual, business specific financial details. I think those are things that you can go over. Um, in private with suppliers or with yourself and what makes sense for your own financial details. Um, and I think the other thing is that I just want to make sure that we're not too focused on like the farm brewery aspect of this. This is New York ingredients and I want this as I think Jason, um, I think I'll just blame Jason. Um, he, I think that he had a great a great way to talk about New York ingredients, and that is our use of New York ingredients, our celebration of what we have in front of us. And we should, I want to hold this, uh, this session in a, as a forum, as an open forum about our ability to celebrate these ingredients together. Um, we, and we'll learn more about what that is, obviously I'm like, I did some of this stuff, so I know what you're about to experience to a certain degree. But I'll let that narrative take over. And um, hands raised, I think the format we're going to go through is everyone's going to present probably like 15, 20 minutes of presentation. And then the, the guts and glory of this whole thing is opening up to you all for questioning and you all to really have a great experience that leads to when we leave this room, we leave having a clear vision, and if it's not clear, we know where to go to make it more clear about what we're doing in the state and about what it means to each of our individual businesses and how to be successful with that model and successful with the celebration of what we have right in front of us in New York State. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so, uh, we'll start with, I guess, the malt side of things. I'm gonna get this out of the way because you can already tell I'm pretty loud. I'm trying to get a joke here, but you know, I'm not like I'm not as good as like the coma FD and like all this other stuff. I don't know if you guys watch that. It's great. So. Okay, let's go. Uh, we're gonna have Jeff first. Are you gonna introduce us or? Uh, what? Are you introducing me? I would like you to introduce yourself because no. you know more about you than I do. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, I don't want to give these people the bias of knowing what I want to do. So. <laughs> you agree with me? Just first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ted. So, uh, my name is Jeff Trout. We own Foreman Farms uh, in the Finger Lakes area. 
Uh, we've been, let's see, we started, originally the farm started around 1815. Um, through a few years in the late 19th century, I'm sorry, late, yeah, 19th century, 1900s, um, the farm was lost to actually excessive use of alcohol in a poker game. Uh, <laughs> that's actually how we met. <laughs> <laughs> it all goes full circle. Then my uh, great grandfather actually bought the original farm back. So, anyways, uh, we've been working on uh, malting or sorry, malting barley since around 2014, right at the beginning. Worked with a number of uh, malsters like Ted and others. Um, through that time period, we've, we've kind of stuck through it. I remember back in 2013, 2014. It was actually a cooperative extension uh, meeting in Batavia, and um, there was probably 30, 40 farmers there. And now, I would say, at least in our area, the Finger Lakes were down to maybe two or three who sort of stuck with it and, and gone through the experimentation, the trials, and the tribulations of uh, growing malting barley. And the nice thing about that, the great thing about that, the thing to celebrate, as Adam said, is really the fact that not only have we stuck with it, but through the work of the folks, the Mulsters, through the brewers, and finding out what people want, um, working with Hartwood College, Cornell uh, University, and such, we've really figured out how to make, I think, what is really, really a great product and something for New York State and all of us to celebrate. Uh, are we doing this, sir? Oh, yeah, Ted, do you want to give an introduction? Um, yes, I'm not good, guys. I've got two different slides. He's, I'm Ted Hawley with New York Craft Malt in Batavia. Uh, I'll be coming up next. Uh, Jeff will have his spiel, and then I'll come in later. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, okay. So, one of the things, and, and folks, if you know anything about, about growing anything, right, farmers are often compared to uh, folks who go to Vegas because every year is a gamble. Um, one of the biggest gambles about that is uh, the weather and, and how we deal with that and particularly with what's going on in the climate and the changes that we're dealing with. Uh, you know, the, the climate that my great-grandfather, grandfather dealt with, um, so we're, we're changing that. Our seasons are fluctuating, but they're getting actually starting earlier, in some cases going longer. Uh, and what we're seeing is a real rise in uh, you know, traumatic events where you know, hard rain falls, uh, maybe less frequently, but more intense through that time, and we have to be able to adapt to that and also deal with the, you know, the environmental impacts of, of growing, whether it's a commercial crop or a specialty crop like barley. So we have to be really attuned to, and that's where not only do we have to know what you want, right, and what uh, Ted can uh, malt, and what you want to brew, and what your customers want to buy, we've got to also kind of overlay that with what can we actually grow in this changing climate. What's going to put up with you know drought or, or massive rain events or something? Unfortunately, we had happened last year. We had an amazing uh, spring barley crop of uh, Hannah, uh, which is a specialty barley spring barley we do for Valley Mall, and um, we had a really amazing crop of naked oats for Ted that we were growing, and um, <laughs> we got this windstorm uh, right about wind and heavy rain probably just a couple of weeks before harvest, and it just, I mean, that, that's a good uh, representation, it just flattened it. And we're, particularly with the oats, we might get 100 bushel. Um, we ended up with eight bushel per acre, uh, that, that kind of thing. So that was, that was not fun, but again, we adapt. And it, it, what I always come back to, and one of the things that well, I'm glad to be here and the thing to celebrate is the fact that I love working with all these people, and with these, to be a part of that and be a part of this whole chain, particularly at the beginning, and to end up with a product that actually can be used and you know, enjoyed and celebrated, that's, that really makes that special. It's a lot different than the soybeans we grow or the corn we grow, which you know, are just really simple commodities. So yeah, we deal with a lot of this stuff. Um, luckily, through our work with uh, particularly Cornell and their breeding program, we've been able to deal with the pre-spouting uh, sort of the drought conditions somewhat, and, and really Mother Nature. The, the wet conditions, you know, when I started in 2014, sort of as an experiment, we would put the crop on probably not our best crop. Right? It's an experiment, we want to reserve that. What I quickly learned uh, was, okay, don't do that. You've really got to put this crop on your best crop. 
So our, our best tile ground, um, our best uh, fertility, um, and then lo and behold, it resulted in a much, a much better product. But again, working with Cornell and those so because we do on our farm for about the last eight to 10 years, we've got uh, Cornell variety trials right on our farm. So that's great, not just for all farmers, but for us in particular, because now we can see how those varieties, and they do all, uh, all springs and winter different crops, oats, wheat, barley, and such, but it allows us to kind of really fine tune what works really well for us. Um, and that, that's been a great relationship, and we're really appreciative of that. <coughs> Which gets us exactly to that. So as we're thinking about, um, you know, what's gonna work for all of you, we're also thinking about what's going to work well for us, because in order for us to give you a great product that's usable, we've got to think about where is it going to be, when, when are we going to plant it, when are we going to harvest it, what are we going to spray it with in terms of uh, uh, weed control and insecticides. And typically, let's say we'll go in um, with our winter crop, we'll try to get it around, try to get it planted somewhere between September and uh, mid-October. It's just kind of a sweet spot. And then uh, you know, we'll, we'll go in, um, might do a short fertilizer application there, but then in the spring, a very, very light nitrogen application, then follow up with a herbicide, um, an insecticide, or excuse me, a fungicide. We don't, really use, we don't really need to use insecticides. But again, so that we can prevent some of that fasarium uh, uh, and some of the uh, leaf diseases that occur during that time. And then, what's really, really important, particularly compared to the days of my grandparents, they used to grow barley from cows. It's different now, right? Then you might want to wait till it's dry. Now what we try to do is, depending on the variety, right, we might try to get in there early when it's still a little bit green and a little bit wet, and then get it into the bin where it's nice and protected. I can sleep at night because I know it's in the bin. And we put the fans on, and we might have low, we, we've gone to the point where all our bins have um, Air floors, they all have fans, and they all have low temperature dryers. Because what you don't want to do is you know, dry it too fast or too hot, because then, then, then it'll last forever, but it's not going to germ very well for Ted when he goes to put a small house. So we try to keep, we'll set them, you know, get the air, pay attention to the humidity and the, uh, the outside temperature, get that air on it, and probably run them right around 90 degrees uh, temperature and just dry it out so that it's, it's perfect and it's get it down to around between 12 and 13 percent moisture. So if we've got to hold it for a while or we bag it or we put it in totes uh, for Ted or you know, another monster, it's, it's ready to go and it's dry. And they know it's dry, so if they've got it in the warehouse, is it, um, it's going to be okay. But again, uh, you know, unlike some of the commodities, commodity crops, with the barley, it really depends on variety when we have to go in and get it and how we have to treat it once we have it in the bin. For example, uh, uh, Valley Mall, they're, they, uh, they've had us do Endeavor for them, uh, the Endeavor uh, barley, older variety. I think it malts really well, but it's really, really temperamental. You can look at it, you can spit on it, and it germinates. So we've got to be really careful. We'll go in there with the combine early, which is sometimes a little rough on the combine because you're putting that more uh, moisture product through it, tougher product to get out. But we get in there early, about 22% moisture, get it into the bin, get it dry down um, with, with air as much as we can, and then we've got to protect it. Violet, on the other hand, you know, a different variety, or the new winter variety that Cornell's developing, which we have 50 acres in the ground now, lightning, um, that's more tolerant. So you know, if we get a bad storm or something, and you know, it's not essential that we get in there at that higher moisture and get it harvested. So it's just a matter of kind of knowing what you're doing, experimenting. And as I told off, I just talked to the farmer from Seneca Castle the other day. He was thinking about doing it. I'm like, if, if you're willing, again, yeah, not that, but if you're willing to lose, right? Because that's how you learn is when you when you have those failures. So if you're willing to do that, I'm like, okay, go try. You know, here I can give you some guidelines, but it's going to be different on your farm, and your ground, and your particular situation. So yeah, we do these trials with uh, Cornell. We've done them now, like I said, for probably probably going on eight years, and that's uh, this, a new spring variety. Not it's a few years old now, but we've done this uh, Celsius Gold. Uh, spring variety where we are in the state 
springs aren't the easiest to do. Um, they tend not to yield as well. But like I say, if um, if you folks say but that's what I want, well then that's what we'll grow. You know, we will figure out a way to do it. And we've certainly done that. But like I said, uh, Valley Mall, they have a spring variety called Hannah. Um, we don't have to go too, I mean, unless people want it, I'm sorry. we don't have to go too variety specific because right. we'll just get like yeah. varieties like. Um, so you're saying move out? Yeah. It's fine. You won't hurt my feelings. Yeah, yeah. I'm obviously not worried about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe. The poker table. No, that's fine. <laughs> so um, there's there's a couple other varieties. Like I said, they're doing lightning, and that's that's a winter variety. Again, that'll be great for us because we do better with winters. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just with Tom. Yeah. So you'll be walking around. Yeah, and I'll be walking around. Say hi. We'll keep opening it up. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take, talk a little bit on the malt side of things, uh, and we have kind of a, a team atmosphere here, so I'm going to assemble the, the dream team for you. Uh, I'll try to. Where's the uh, up to down? Okay. So just uh, a little, a little of the past. Uh, I think everybody <coughs> in this room has been around for a while, but. Uh, I guess the odds were making great strides in New York State. Uh, we've come a long way. The New York State Farm Brewing uh, Law uh, was passed in 2012 and uh, came into effect January 1st, 20, 2013. At that time, there was only 75 acres of uh, malting barley grown. Uh, the grain was not great. The malt was not great. You cannot make good malt with bad grains. We've come a long way. Uh, learning how to grow it, uh, how to, you know, exactly what Jeff went through. Uh, there's a lot that goes on at the farm. And you got to put it, everybody didn't want to risk it in the beginning and they put it on all their bad soils. And that was, that took a while to get them to use their good soil. But uh, as the maltsters, uh, what we have, what we needed, uh, Harbor College got involved and uh, they're uh, an essential team member of, uh, of what we do, uh, we, we get grain analytics from them and also malt analytics from them. So before the malt house uh, accepts uh, grains and barley, other, other grains as well, uh, we got to get it tested for malt quality. Um, and here's three, three samples. Uh, there's a great one, a good one, a not so good one, but uh, I got my handy pointer here. Uh, and it's pretty blurry, sorry. But, uh, We've got uh, pretty much the moisture level, protein, test weight. Test weight should be around 48. This is 52, really nice. Moisture is 11.5, awesome. Uh, protein, 9.6, this is dialing in, beautiful. Uh, hard to get a year like this. Correct? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the pump fits, 95.9, big kernels, and the germination test, so we have we do a four milliliter test and an eight milliliter test. That means in a Petri dish, we put four milliliters of water in uh, that Petri dish with 100 uh, kernels of barley or grains. Uh, and we do see how it germinates in three days. And we also do an eight milliliter. Uh, this is 78 and 38. Doesn't look good, right? However, the germination energy is 99%. So you know it's dormant. So we know we just have to do a waiting game on that grain. So we, uh, we just wait and wait, and how they do that, they put the uh, hydrogen peroxide in there, it brings it out of dormancy real quick. So, and the RVA is, uh, is a pre-sprout uh, gauge that we go by. Uh, this is 161, pretty much no pre-sprout at all. And the down level here, which is a, the fungus level, uh, gotta be one part per million around it. So these are like, these are reports that are Generally available for people who are this helped out with them, and yeah, if you have some grain, people how to read it well, and well, the, the farmer sends it in. Even though the farmer sends it in, I make it. Just, I look at it. I say, okay, this is something I want to try. Uh, I will send, get some samples, like a tote, two thousand pounds maybe. I will send it in to to Harvard myself as well, just to make sure uh, everybody's honest and nothing's changed. And are but, all of you? How how are are, are, grain, are grain quality reports part of your typical protocol at the brewery? Anyone? Okay, great. Excellent. 
So this is just rain analysis. Yeah. So uh, if you can see here, I'll go through it quickly, but the moisture here is 15.1%. That's not going to store well at all. It, uh, it'll probably stop germinating uh, within three or four months. Uh, so we have uh, you know, 11.5 marginal protein. Uh, the weight is 49, it's really nice. Uh, I, uh, uh, I pump kernels. Uh, and you go all the way down, and it's got some dormancy, but it's still 99% germination rate. It's dormant, we have to wait a little bit. And finally, the end one here, this is a little problematic one here. Uh, now, the uh, moisture looks good for storage. Uh, the, uh, the weight dials in. However, uh, germination capacity is at 95. I will not uh, uh, accept anything uh, below 95% germination rate. That's already marginal. It's going to drop off and it's dropping off because the RBE is at 28. It's very pre sprouted grains. Uh, seeing that. And the down level dials in as well. The down level, you guys have been spraying really nice and that's not an issue as much as it has been in the past. Uh, so, uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, so, team member, multi barley growers. Uh, in 11 short years, New York uh, growers have helped, with the help of Cornell, Harvard College, small houses, and you guys, the brewers, uh, working as a team, uh, have stepped up uh, growing high quality malting barley, wheat, rye, oats, other small grains. Uh, it's not just barley that we need malt quality, it's all the grains. It's the rye, it's the wheat, you guys are using all these grains uh, for what you need. Um, so team member, the monsters. Uh, give the monsters a, a, a clap. Yeah, we got Hudson Gallagher. Yeah. We're in it for the long run, but in 11 short years, New York monsters have stepped it up, <coughs> producing high quality malt in every imaginable color, flavor, uh, with New York grown grains. We've got light roast, we've got dark roast, smoked caramels, the flakes. Uh, for per pretty much, the monsters are producing uh, everything you guys need make any kind of beer. Uh, not only that, the team members, you guys, the brewers, you're the final team. You're, you're, the, you're, you're very essential to what we're doing or we're not doing it for anybody. Uh, so team member brewers, other short years, brewers have stepped up using 100% of New York own grains and beers, winning local, state, and national awards. Uh, from the Governor's Cup to uh, collegiate, uh, uh, this is a collegiate, national collegiate Pills there that, uh, yeah. Michael Coons, are you here? No, okay. He, he was the brewer there at uh, Morrisville. Uh, they had a, a brewery program there. Uh, this one here was a nice spot uh, uh, with a, a smoked lilac. And uh, on this life, we got them as a Rupert's Cup, a local New York City, uh, and, and the others, you know. It's, Send us what you guys can do, the quality is there, and you guys are making quality beer with New York grains. Uh, Cornell reported this last fall in 2023 uh, in the Barley Malt Summit that there's 2,000 acres of malting barley being grown consistently in New York. Uh, we could use more. Uh, however, consistently means quality, uh, 2,000 acres of quality malting barley uh, is being grown. Uh, current list of producers and suppliers of New York grown malts and frozen flakes, uh, Convergence, Kraft Malt in Albany, Country Malt Group, Champlain, New York, Hudson Valley Malt, Germantown, New York, Rumoration Malt in Bloomfield, New York Kraft Malt in Batavia, Niagara Malt in Cambria, New York, Subversive Malt in Livingston, and Valley Malt in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, not every malt house is sold out, many have plenty of supply. Uh, if your current provider is out of stock, please consider the other ones. Uh, and finally, the New York Green Dream Team is winning. Somebody buy that lady here. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. So good farmers with with malts. It's it's good to hear that we're in a place where they're available. Um, something that we don't get from every ingredient all the time. Um, 
as we may learn more about from the hops side of the world. Um, and again, we're also, uh, this is, uh, do you all want to introduce yourselves from the, the hops side? I just want to make comments and smile. Yeah. 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 Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Kinsella. I'm a fourth generation farmer from Eastern Long Island. Uh, we grow a number of crops, hops uh, being one of them. And I'm Chris Holden, as some of you guys know, uh, one of the owners at the Hop Guild of Austin Mountain Farm in uh, Addison, New York, uh, called Crooked Creek Hops. Um, so, <clears throat> with the help of Hop Group in New York, Adam and John, uh, Adam is the deputy executive director there, um, and John is uh, the city president. Um, this last year we, we have a rough estimate of 159 acres that was harvested. Um, as we talked about that number last week with um, Mr. Saylor, he was a little worried about that number and some of the, the, that specific number might worry some of you over here. Something to be thoughtful about with that is there's at least 20% of the acreage that is actually in New York, whether it's trellis or cops that are in the ground sitting dormant right now, um, it's either waiting for, for contracts or they are replanting that. Another quick fact about the 159 acres, though, is that there are other countries in the world that have less acres than that in their entire country. Um, that number has gone up and down, and some of those are, have been major growing regions in the past. Um, another cool thing, 30 plus varieties um, is what was what we've seen and counted for um, the number of varieties that harvested us last year. Five. Yeah, so that's, yeah, I think that's what we got up to. So <clears throat> we're trying to give a rough estimate there as well. Um, but that's something to think about that if you guys are not finding something that you're specifically looking for, it's, it, there's a good chance it's out there. I mean, I don't think there's probably any brewery in this room that's using 30 to 45 varieties. We are awesome. But make sure you're looking around, um, checking with other, other farmers, other suppliers, and what they've got going on and what they want to do. Um, the next two slides are going to be a little bit about uh, um, pounds per acre and the variations in the growing seasons between 2022 and 2023. Uh, 2022 was a phenomenal growing season. Uh, it was super, super dry. It was nice and warm almost all summer long. I remember on our farm, we didn't see a drop in rain for three months. Um, and and, and it, it, it presented challenges for certain growers in, in certain parts of the state and the, uh, the the, the types of soil that they're in, uh, but overall it, it was an awesome, awesome growing season. Uh, the top five best yielding hops that year, Cascade, uh, eight um, pounds per acre, all the way up to 1,700. We've seen, seen higher than that in the past. Uh, Comet came in at number two, about 1,300 pounds per acre. Uh, Notable here, the Vista, the, the Triumph, were the second year um, hops at that point in time. Uh, and they're also under, um, they were under uh, non-irrigated situations. So there was no irrigation done on those yards and that's how they ended up at. Chinook also did really well. Um, and it always does seem to be really well in, uh, in non-irrigated, or sorry, in hot, dry weather. This last year was almost exact opposite. Um, it was very challenging. It was a great growing season still. But it started off extremely hot. Um, I think one of the hottest, if not the hottest day of the year was in March. Um, and then it was super cold. Um, in the, well, not quite as cold as it is out right now, but you're talking high 30s and 40s all the way through until training um, in March, or sorry, May. And uh, there was definitely a huge shift in the way some of these hop varieties um, transitioned and, and, and how they reacted. And as you can see, uh, the top performer was Triumph. Um, Columbus coming in at number two. John was the, the grower of that, I don't know that one. Cascade took a little bit of a slump. Um, it, it, it struggled with those spring conditions. Um, and popping back out of the ground after they were pruned. And it was just slow growing, um, getting, up the, getting up the wire since it was so cold at the end of May. June it warmed up, but then it was also really, really wet um, th um, throughout July and into August. And in some cases that was nice because it gave good quality to the hops as long as they were clean. Um, <clears throat> this that we saw struggled a little bit again, and we think that was mostly because of the wet weather. This is more of a drought tolerant hop, so it likes those hot, dry weather um, conditions. 
Um, but again, it's still showing that it's very consistent over two extremely different growing seasons, just like Triumph and, of course, the three top ones that would be Triumph, Cascade, and Vista. Another notable one, the Comet did dip quite a bit, but it was still just under 900 pounds per acre. And then Foggle, you see Foggle up there, and crazy, you can probably see that, but Foggle does halfway decent here in New York. Um, next thing we wanted to show is in, in state versus out state sales. Um, so about 82% of all the sales um, that all merchants, suppliers, farms have uh, um, reported this last year were done here in New York State with about an average of 18 being uh, done out of the state. As much as 35% per variety has been sold out of the state. Um, and for the, the 2020, be 2022 crop year, be 2023 fiscal year. Um, so the goals of the, the hop industry over the next five, four or five years is something that John and Adam have come up with um, as they're leading kind of the Growers Association, is implementing um, a strategic agronomy plan to increase yield and acreage. Um, this is drastically important, just as Cornell has done that for the malt side. Um, hop growers in New York are starting to step up to do that for, um, for the hop growers, which uh, should help out a tremendous amount. Between these two guys, they've, they've been able to really get some, some growers that we even work with that we've um, kind of bugged them for years to try, to try different things out, get some different equipment. We're putting on seminars to teach these guys how to do it. It's, uh, it's actually really inspiring uh, to see that this stuff's happening. Uh, number two is a pilot program and collaboration with public breeding program. So there's multiple public breeding pro programs out there out there right now. There's WSU, there's OSU, um, there's Top Quality Group, which has some really cool stuff, things, really cool things going on. Um, I could let Geo back there talk about that. If you guys want to know more about that, but if you're not looking into what they have going on, you should be joining them. I bug Jason about it all the time because they have some really exciting hops coming out in the pipeline at that. Growers here in New York would love to see. And then obviously we have the Cornell breeding program as well. Um, and the goal here is trying to get more of these public hops, like the Triumph and the Vista that have been released here recently, here into the state to show that they can work here. One of the, the, the huge things that uh, Kayla Altendorf at WSU said four or five years ago now when she first took over at WSU, she said, there's probably over 10,000 different varieties that were thrown away because they didn't grow in Washington. They didn't even try in New York. They never got to try in here in New York. And the, the industry that she came from, you could grow something in Iowa, and just over the state or state line in Minnesota didn't grow worth a crap. So these are huge things that um, there's a lot of potential here in New York, and there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts that are going on to make things happen. Um, next one's create uh, short and long-term stability through spot and forward contracting for growers and merchants. And this, these things are huge. I know that there's a huge surplus of um, hops nationally, or certain varieties. That's not necessarily the case here in New York. And we have a really unique position being that we have amazing malt being grown, amazing hops being grown here, and that um, as a community, we can really strive to push this forward. And um, also, like, to tie in the, I, I, just as moderator, like, to tie in the importance of malt here, I think it's really important to note that in our ingredients, one of the messages here is that we have a good supply of malt that's healthy and we're, we're reporting that there's overages and there's, it's easy to get in participation. And with hops, we're somewhat inverted where there is a deficit to a certain degree. So both need participation, different types of participation. But I don't want, I want to make sure that malt is highlighted that they're doing a great job on that side too in terms of keeping that supply going. Yeah, I mean, it's something to think about. I mean, we, I hear so many brewers talk about Germany and like what they have going on there and the, the cool things with malt and um, hops over there, obviously, right? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever been to another state in the United States, another region that has the ability to do what we do. I mean, John being on Long Island, I'm in Southern Tier, we got growers in the Northern uh, the northern parts of the state, um, up here, Lake Ontario. I mean, it's, it's a huge diversification, um, and I think it's something that you know we should all be proud of that we have that ability to do to do that with these state-grown ingredients. Um, last one is to expand and develop an interstate export markets due to the quality, um, meeting and or exceeding national quality standards. I think we're already there with the quality side of things, um, but it comes down to the supply and making sure that we have the supply that we can feed it outside the state, outside the country, um, and really start making 
New York a, a, a national or international recognized growing um, region. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the state of the hop industry as it relates to an individual farm. And as the president of Hop Growers in New York, I can say that the perspective that I'm about to give to, to you all is, is very valid for all of the hop farmers um, across the state. Um, so first, first we have uh, farm value. So what is, you know, it's, it's certainly easy to pick up the phone and, and call one person for all your ingredients, right? But what is, what is the value of working directly with a farm um, and, and, and building that relationship and um, creating, you know, a good rapport with a farmer? Um, so one of the things that jumps out to me the most is that, you know, a direct relationship with a farm really provides a unique access to your ingredients um, and enables you to send a strong marketing message um, which can certainly help uh, differentiate yourselves you know in a very competitive um, market that we're seeing right now with, with craft beer um, you know a farm a farm can grow you know the possibilities are endless you know a farm can grow hops specifically for you um, work together to seek out a variety that you might want um, get them in the ground um, you know we can have you and your team come to the farm for hop sensory um, as an educational thing for your 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 uh, tap room staff um, your brewers um, you can come do hop. You can come do uh, farm. You know hop sensory um, in relation to harvest timing. You know, do you want do you want that cascade to hang a little longer, or do you think it's perfect for the beer you're trying to make right now? Um, we can do creative collaborations, um, and you know those collaborations and that partnership between brewer and farmer, you can really tell a story, um, and it's a powerful story. You know to convey uh, to the end consumers. And it's, it's difficult for the farm to do that. It's really, you know, we as farmers are here to help you all do that because you are the direct link um, to that end consumer. Um, so about diversification, as I mentioned, our farm um, was started by my great grandfather in 1920. Um, prior to that, it has history going back in the 1700s. But since my great grandfather, um, we've had to reinvent our farm multiple times. There's only one thing that we still do from them, and that's strawberries. Um, other than that, we've had to continually look for new crops and, and ways to remain uh, relevant and to target, you know, newer markets to, to keep the farm going um, all those generations. So. You know, I think working directly with a farm or with New York ingredients, um, it allows you to, you know, diversify your ingredient sourcing to try something new and, and unique. Um, you know, it's been proven that, you know, for instance, Cascade grown in the PNW is not the same as Cascade grown here. Um, so there, there's a lot, there's a lot worth trying and worth exploring um, in that vein. And, you know, right now, hop farmers all across the state, we're working to diversify and try to provide, you know, more options and better options for brewers to source New York hops um, on your own terms. Um, and one of the biggest things that, like, I want to drive home today in this brief talk is regarding the supply chain signaling. Um, Farmers, <clears throat> farmers, <clears throat> whether you're talking for, through a merchant or directly to a farm, we need to hear from brewers. And we, it's, farmers right now, you know, we cannot continue to take on 100% of the risk in growing hops solely on speculation. Um, you know, hop farmers all across the state, we're, le we're, we're left with a very core group of very serious growers. And all of them, including myself, are poised to expand quite a bit. You know, we have the land, we have the passion for hops, we have the know-how. Like Chris mentioned, you know, we're, we're producing very high quality hops in the state. Um, and it's, you know, I can, I, I often get the call, you know, and it, it's, the call is, you know, hey, what do you have? 
And I think if we all collectively can work towards changing that dynamic to be a little more proactive, and like my question to what do you have is, well, what do you want? What do you guys need? What's important to you? Um, and how can we work together to deliver that to, to you all? Um, you know, hop farmers are eager to get more hops in the ground and, and do that. Um, and, you know, hop farmers all across the state, as was mentioned, you know, we're willing to contract small volumes of hops, you know, 88 pounds, 44 pounds, whatever works for your business. You know, there's no minimum orders uh, like some of the larger outfits. Um, we want to work with you. And, you know, as was mentioned earlier, this is one thing that I keep coming back to is, you know, being New Yorkers, we have a really special thing going on here in the state where we have you know, extremely high quality grain farms and maltsters. Um, we have high quality hops being grown. And when you step back and look, there's breweries in every state across the country, but there's only a very small amount of states that have that, that resource in the hop farms, the maltsters, right in their backyard. Um, so I think it's important to, to realize that and like we've been saying, to celebrate it and to be able to tell a story, that, you know, behind that and just to kind of wrap it up is, I think the more participation that we get in the New York supply chain between grains and hops, um, the more it's gonna to continue to improve and the better it's gonna be, the more things we're gonna be able to offer. Um, and you know, New York ingredients, it's a story worth worth celebrating and a unique story you know, worth telling. Um, so you thank, all on the mall thank side. you. You're on the mall side too, is that a similar thing in terms of Supply chain signaling, the more information the better. Yeah, well, I mean this is I think this is a common misconception too. Like what's your turn time? If you hear a request, how long does it take for you to fulfill that request? I need a thousand pounds of pale malt. Uh, on or, the malt side, uh, we can turn that over pretty quickly. Uh, except uh, on the grower side, they're more of, you know. Yeah. I mean, like, what, what's the, what's the a year ahead, we got to know what. Back in the day, there was only one seed company that was offering, okay, this is all you have to grow. Malt, malt, malt. So now we're going to Oregon. We're going out and getting our own seed and planting it. We're not, we're not, the local seed companies, uh, they don't make any money other than corn and soybeans. You know, they don't want to even deal with malt and hot side, yeah, and hot side, like, what's your threshold? So you say you can get capsized by 44 pounds, <laughs> depending on the variety. It depends on the variety, and you know it takes us, you know, about three years between sourcing root material, getting it in the ground, building the trellis system, caring for that plant, allowing it to mature to a point where it's um, able to be be sold as a hop, you know, to a brewer. So it is a lot of lead time. That's why I say like it's really difficult for us to go 100% on on speculation. Um, you know, because of that, that huge window where it's, you know, three, three years plus to, from planting it to being able to sell it. And so I just want to make sure we've got about 14 minutes left here, 15 minutes. minutes. One more slide. One more slide? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, that's kind of based on what we're just talking about, planning for the future of the impact. So speculation, speculation. It's very difficult for, say, a merchant like myself, even though I'm a grower, to be like, hey, I'm gonna go put some in, I'm gonna ask them to go put it in. If I can't, if I can't go to a grower and ask them to grow something with a contract for something that might not yield very well, it's easy for me to say, hey, let's go put some cascading, let's go put some triumph in, let's go put some this in. We know that they're gonna be proven. Um, and, and that's being done. But if it's something else that maybe it hasn't been proven here, or it has been proven to not grow very well, but maybe someone is willing to grow it, because there are people that are willing to grow things that are a little tougher. Speculation of this being talked about, that's happened many, many, many times before where it just sits in the cooler. And people wonder why, oh, hey, all of a sudden, where'd this come from? It's like, oh yeah, we found it in the back of the cooler. It's been sitting there for two years. Wanna buy it? And this, these, are, these are true examples. These are things that happen. Contracts are key with that. You know, what we have going on here in New York is very different than what the national um, situation is, you know. New York cops, there's there's enough, but if there's something that you're missing, something to be able to back that up as contracts. To be able to do that, you need a good communication. You know, communication from the native John as a grower 
any grower that we might work with, or any any growers that are out there, other growers that you, you want to talk to, you have to have that communication so they know what's going on, what your needs are, what you're looking for. Maybe what you're looking for is one thing, but there's a better option out there for both you and them. And that's the communication. Okay, so education, obviously, is the next part of that. You kind of base that as well, right? Maybe you want a color type, but maybe crystal grows better. Not, these aren't 100% examples, just using them, throwing them out there. But there's new hops coming down the pipeline that maybe you guys don't know about, that maybe we do, that would work well for a replacement for SOTS, or a replacement for color tower, or a replacement for Cascade or Centennial. These are huge, huge, huge things to be educated on, and I think the biggest and best sources of that are people like hoppers in New York, um, as well as any of the merchants or growers or um, hop resources out there that are kind of on top of these things. I want to make sure we have enough time here that we're turning it over to the audience so that you all have, like you have the, the some of the best of New York industry here to question on the malt side. We have growers of the barley and, and the grains, you have growers of the hops plus the processors. What to you, like this is the this is the time where we can talk to them. So any questions, any key dynamics that you want to communicate to them that what is gonna help facilitate you to get involved with them and to learn more or what makes a difference. What parts that they did they touch on that you feel that they should maybe talk more about that you haven't heard before or have heard before but want to hear more. You know? Uh, yeah, the team all seem to touch on a little bit like that you struggling with climate change stuff. What steps are you trying to take for the future to actually mitigate how much they're damaging or reducing the crops that you have? Um, good question. Yeah, so uh, we've been involved now with a number of USDA uh, and New York State programs to create a sustainable environment. And so particularly like we, it may not be directly related to it, but um, <clears throat> most of our ground now is that we have grass waterways. We're trying to do more with no-till um, and vertical tillage to reduce the impact of, you know, particularly those are the most damaging thing are those heavy rain events that are just, I mean, last year we probably had, and I know we had three events where we got, you know, multiple inches of water within two to three hours and then just, you know, that there's your best soil being washed away. So the nice thing is, and this is where it fit, with barley fits in with us very well is, uh, being that it gets off a few weeks earlier than winter wheat, we can get right in there, we'll, we'll leave the stubble on the ground, and we're even getting to the point where we are, um, Instead of bailing the straw or shredding it, putting it back on, which means we don't have to then go and buy potash because there's a high degree of potash, more in wheat straw, but barley as well. So that's that's helping us on the financial side. It's also it's a, it's a slow release and it builds organic matter. And the more we can build that up, and then we'll follow it immediately with cover crops. Um, so barley works really nicely with that because then that ground is covered um, really the rest of the year through the most intense rainfalls. So that, that all kind of works in this sort of a systematic approach. That makes sense? I mean, otherwise, in terms of the crop itself, it's really trying to find the variety that can withstand that, that change. Um, and I think Cornell is doing it the best they can. It just, it just takes time to, to kind of breed those varieties. But then we've just got to be, we've got to be equally ready, so, you know, old fashioned stuff, we just got to get in there and get it. And that, that's the biggest thing. Again, you know, once it's in the bin, we can sleep better, we can air on, we can control it a little bit more, and, and do that stuff, so. Yes. I mean, the other thing too is just, I think, in general, that, uh, you know, these, these crops have been around for a long time. They've gone through many different cycles as well. We are facing new novel things, but they're the ones in the field paying attention. If this means that, the hop harvest has moved up a week. You're the ones paying attention. They're the ones paying attention. If we, there's malt side of it. Being on the cusp of that and having that question is really important too. It's continuing to ask that question. Uh, I thought you had a question? Yeah, I was just thinking you were talking a lot about um, you know, flow of information from the brewers as far as what we're looking for. 
you know, so you guys can plan, which makes a lot of sense. I, I think for us, flow of information back the other way helps a lot too. I mean, we're all willing to experiment. We're all willing to try, you know, just to pick on hot, we're all willing to try new hot products. But we need to know, you know, okay, what are you gonna grow? When are you gonna have it? Uh, and then what do you know about it, right? Because for us, it's sometimes the stab in the dark to say, you know, I spot some new hops I never used. I did it last week, this pretty good. Right okay, so I'm going to somebody's website where they're gonna show me that, oh, this one's tropical. This one's, it's always the same, you know, it's a lot of the same buzzwords because that's what sells, which makes sense. But if there's a way to get full of information about what you, what you are growing, what's going to be available, and then any information you can provide on, hey, here's somebody who's used it who's telling you this is what it was like in my field. Because hop rubbing is not always the best way, at least for me personally. I have a hard time uh, lining up hop rubbing aromas with what actual hops in the beer aromas are like. So if there's a way to make that kind of two-way information straight, I think that would be helpful long term. Yeah, I think that that's, that's something that I think all of us are growing in how we, now that we're putting more organization behind this, I mean, there, there is a huge part of the feedback loop that starts with uh, like the suppliers reaching out and saying, you know, have you tried our, have you tried the difference between our locally produced malt versus the other? What is, here's what we know about it. Here's something to help you with it. Here's something to substantiate. It goes in the market messaging as well. And for for Hutch's question, this, yeah. this is very much why, why I bought these beers, was for people to see what our beers, not to you know, showcase like these are, you know, this is, this is a, a hazy idea that we were able to do with their products, uh, and this is how we achieved it. Um, you know, so it, 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 we, we have examples out there, and I want you guys to come to us and to other people that are brewing these beers with these ingredients, so we can have these conversations. Because this is what it, this is what it's about, and so this is what I want. You know, I'm not just having you give me beer, you know, because I want to give you beer, but like it's to talk. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's to talk to talk about these these conversations and be able to like express how we came about, and you know, this is. You know, it's not necessarily the same hazy IP that's out there that can be made with all of those other like hops from the West Coast and whatever. But this is this is what we were able to achieve. This is our top seller in our brewery. Um, you know, because people like hazy IPAs, and so this is why we have uh, one, of, one of these varieties. But like this this conversation is extremely important. But also getting as much information from you, and not just you know like what this variety could be like, but like give us the analytics. Give us as much analytics, as much data so that we can utilize it as possible, because that is how we're going to make informed decisions about the beers that we're doing. Um, so yeah, no, it's like this, this information needs to be accessible and flowable across all sectors. Yeah, help, help, direct, help direct us as well in terms of you know, files or what, what matters to you. Yeah, I would second that. Me and Chris just made a beer that we can drink today, but um, hop sniffing, field, analytics aside, I think that engagement for me was kind of a game changer. You know, to have Chris come out, pick some hops, we brew together. It's like my favorite beer. It's totally changed the way I think about New York hops because I committed to it in a totally different way. So I do think there's a world where we can do more of that, Chris, or like reaching out into ways to, you know, we all collaborate making beers as breweries. But I think the collaboration with the farmer, with the hop supplier, grower, or whatever, uh, I don't know, was super valuable for me. That's, that's kind of why I put that up there. <clears throat> we're trying to find a quote, and it comes down to, we're, we're all busy. I mean, we're all trying to, to, to grow our businesses or to um, grow the business that we work for. And at the end of the day, we both don't always know what other people know, right? So being curious about that, yeah, we, we have to ask more questions. We probably need more questions asked of us too, you know? Okay. I was say, so what, I mean, one example of that is just a little one, but I know every summer, so Valley Mall does a tour with her, uh, she'll, she'll bring her brewers with her on a little band tour, and they come out, they go across New York, and like they'll stop at our farm for a day. And that was one of the best things, because now I've got the brewers, the maltster, and me, and they're actually walking through our fields pre-harvest, you know, seeing what we do and stuff like that, asking questions. And it, it's a short snippet, but then it's it's one way to start that conversation about, hey, what are you doing? What do you need? What are you up against? Hey, here's you know, here's what this costs, here's what that costs, you know, how can we we're we're pretty transparent about it. 
right? And so I think that transparency and that communication is a real plus and helps with what you're talking about. And we have, we have an opportunity, I mean, like, not many states have this opportunity to have malt and hops and analytics at uh, Harvey Lake and stuff. Like, we are very unique, and this is something that we should be capitalizing on and really promoting and then do it because there's amazing stuff out there and we can do amazing stuff. Yeah, uh, as far as analytics go, do you guys, like, do water tests on the rainwater every year in order to see the difference in, because obviously water is a big part of our industry as far as beer making, as far as like you guys keep talking about the weather changing, climate change, does that have any effect on the crops itself, the water that, you know, the rainwater? I think we're That's usually concerned with it. It's not a bad question. Just, I think, yeah. sure. I think volume, volume tends to be the deal of like how much water. I mean, I remember from growing in the from people in the PNW, one of the best yards that we had one of the years was flooded up to the top of the trellis. Right. But I mean, so who like who knows? Yeah, it's, it's as far as water and. and I think that's tough as it goes through that. I know we're getting close to time. I'm fine. Like any any other questions currently? We can take that offline too for sure. Yeah, that's a good detailed question. Any other questions or are we getting kicked out of the room? What happens? I'm, I'm like kind of there's a session or two. Oh, there's a session too. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs>